risks to customers. Papers marked as being classified have been found at the former home of US Vice President Mike Pence. His lawyers say they were inadvertently boxed and transported to the house in Indiana at the end of his term in office. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down 27 points at 77.57. The pound buys $1.23 and €1.13. LBC weather, light rain moving southeastwards across Northern Ireland and Scotland tonight. Mainly dry for England and Wales with a low of minus. Minus five, mostly cloudy tomorrow, with some patchy rain moving southeastwards and a high of 10 Celsius. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Charlotte Morgan. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. Welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question. It's an hour of topical debate. We're relying on your questions. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can text 84850 and you can use Alexa. Just say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC and miraculously it appears on my screen here. And Stephanie Flanders to my right, she has the advantage because she can see them come in so she gets to know the questions maybe before the others. So we have with us on the panel Stephanie Flanders from Bloomberg. We have Fergal Sharkey, environmental campaigner, former frontman of the band The Undertones. We have Mims Davis, social mobility minister and Conservative MP for Mid Sussex. And Barry Gardner, Labour MP for Brent North and former Shadow International Trade Secretary. So that's the panel 0345 6060 973. And don't forget, you can watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850 cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. A environmental company. Right, uh, really? Fergal, you're, <laughs> not, you're not on yet. <laughs> Wait your turn. <laughs> ben in Clacton has our first question. Hello, Ben. Hello, Ian, and good evening, panel. Uh, do the panel agree yeah. with the Archbishop of Canterbury who said today that we should all pay more tax to fund social care? Do you? I totally agree with that, and I would be fair to pay more tax myself. I worked in social care in the in the eighties, and I worked in social care just before COVID, and the, the change is just phenomenal. And I've had personal uh, personal experience. My wife um, being looked after by social care for two years. Barry Gardner. Well, given that I started today in the Archbishop's garden. With well, the, there's a revelation with for us. The, with the RSPB's... Are you sleeping big garden, or something? No, <laughs> RSPB's big garden bird watch. I don't oh, think wow. I'm in any position to uh, uh, to dispute the Archbishop, but look, Ben, I entirely agree with you. Um, I think uh, I don't think we should all be paying more tax. I do think that the burden of the tax that needs to be raised uh, for funding social care should fall on those who can afford it. So I that's the only... Uh, phraseology I would disagree with the Archbishop on. What about the over 50s paying more tax? Because, I mean, in effect, they're the ones that are going to make use of it sooner rather than, <laughs> rather than burden younger people with extra tax. Why not put it on the over 50s? Well, look, I, I dislike the way that often nowadays we're pitting young people against old people. And I, I believe if you want to create a, an inclusive society in which peop- everybody feels part of it, then it is important that this principle of, of universalism applies. That, that's why I'm in favour of, of certain universal benefits. Um, you know, I think it's, it's right that everybody gets child benefit, even if you're somebody earning a lot of money. Um, because then everybody feels they've got a stake in society and that they're going to be cared for. But Ben, I, I sympathise with you what you said about your wife. My parents-in-law are both 90 and they they have uh, carers every day. And quite honestly, the work that those carers do is just amazing. And what always strikes me is that these people are not paid enough. Many of them are on just above minimum wage. And I really do think that we have our values totally wrong in society, that we don't value these essential workers enough, and we really should. And I think it's great the Archbishop said so. So how would you impose extra taxes? I mean, if you don't want to do it universally, uh, I mean, how much extra... Because, I mean, that, that seems to be the default reaction for many Labour politicians. Well, we'll, we'll tax the wealthy a bit more. But, I mean, 
okay, you can say, well, somebody who's got £10 million in the bank, that they, they, they can afford it, but there comes a point yes, of when it's sort of, it do, doesn't really work. Well, the, it, Stephanie will be, be much better to tell you exactly where that point <laughs> is than I. Moment. Um, but look, there, there are lots of ways, you know, I, far be it from me to say that maybe we should uh, stop people squirrelling their, their millions offshore and offshore tax havens. Um, you, you know, that's pretty topical at the moment. Um, Non-DOM status one can look at, but I know that's already paying for lots of yeah, things. Yeah, that's already paying for extra nurses, so you, you can't know, do that one. Exactly. Um, but look, uh, I'm not here to set out uh, what what Labour's budget would be and what Labour's tax uh, regime would be. But I do think it's possible in a civilised society to look after people who are elderly, frail and vulnerable and to do it without putting so much additional burden on the people who are the poorest in society. Stephanie Flanders, it, it, it's very easy to say, well, we can just put taxes up uh, to pay for this or put taxes up to pay for that. But... It will all mount up in the end. Uh, putting taxes up doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, the greatest yeah. solution. And I think the question about the care system, I mean, just to go back to the heart of it, when you say about paying more tax for it, that's about taking responsibility for the care system, which is what we as a, certainly governments, successive governments and certainly successive health secretaries have not done. And we learned that lesson the hard way during the COVID pandemic. So just spend a bit more time on the question. It isn't just about how you would raise tax. It's like how would you think about social care as very much integrated with the NHS and something that is fundamental is crucial for the good running of the NHS as we get older and as we have these burdens you know we see the queues outside the hospitals we know the problems with the you know how beds the overcrowding in hospitals an awful lot of that is to do with the failings of social care and I would say also it's about taking more seriously the local government's role in that you know we sort of didn't pay we didn't feel like we were paying tax for social care we had left it all to councils to be sort of funding it through the through various means um, and then when that when their funding got cut we didn't quite realize how much was coming out of social care so I think it's you know it's very boring to say but it's like we do have to see it sort of as about the places and how different bits of government have unexpected consequences because we haven't thought about it that way we've always thought about it in these silos in Westminster you know sure we can raise more tax but we actually just have to have a different approach as well. Mims Davis. Well my dad had a, an acquired brain injury and was ill for 25 plus years so I come from a family that cared uh, it was what we did and we stepped up and actually for quite a while didn't realise there was any support and many families are in that situation and then quite often you see the person that's done the caring really struggles as well so you can end up with two frail and challenged uh, people to look after so uh, I think there's a bit uh, between uh, six and nine million carers out there unpaid carers and people doing their bit um, and Carers UK do an amazing job and uh, I recently held a, a carers right of, a rights event in my constituency to hear from different carers whether it's long-term disablement acquired uh, injury uh, etc it's really challenging and we need that mixture of family care and social care and I think people get sometimes quite confused about what bid is what as Stephanie said as well around uh, the NHS but the chances are if you're not caring now you'll need to be cared for and if you're not caring now you are going to be caring so whatever age you are young or old uh, as we're as an aging demographic and changing needs we've got to get a grip on this and I'm really pleased that the carers leave bill the extra week off is coming through supported by the government as a private member's bill. Uh, I think that's really important because you need to be there for the doctor's appointments and the changing of things that happen and quite often when you're torn with but work, that's Ben's challenging. Question, because the social care system all political parties have agreed for probably 15-20 years that it's not working and yet here we are with, with no real idea of how to make it work. And I think that's the point about integrating it with the NHS. And the other side of my role at, at DWP is helping fill those vacancies. It's quite remarkable. We've got six to nine million people who've actually got experience in a sector we're desperate for people to come into, yet they don't want to come into it because they're burnt is? out and they're tired. Uh, and so we need to, to get this balance right. I think of supporting carers when they're in that role 
role and also being able to pay and and help them more and also just because you happen to be related to someone doesn't mean you're the best carer for them you need good training and support and resilience um so as i say this and and barry's alluded to it you know this is a cross government cross generational fact that as we live longer we have got to support councils i think councils do so a great job should we job. be paying more tax because we know that social care workers often are paid minimum wage they also aren't paid when they if they're visiting people in their homes they aren't paid for the travel time they often aren't paid for their petrol either yeah I think, it's outrageous. And, and job design and support for, and actually we've got some amazing companies locally at, at, who do a brilliant job in really challenged circumstances, keeping people uh, in the community. In terms of tax, I think, you know, it's about making sure that the whole NHS system works, that, you know, the front door and the back door work, uh, that the huge amounts of money that is going in works, and that there isn't a, some kind of second class when it comes to our care. the Archbishop says not enough money is going in, therefore taxes should rise. Look, the Archbishop is right to, to put the point on caring because this isn't going away and I do think that the cap on caring and as we're coming up to a budget and there's lots of interest in this I think as I say it's not going to disappear. Some parties have a clear one penny on income tax that they're prepared to put forward but at the moment the tax burden and what we're paying back from Covid is really challenging and I'm sure there's people listening to this programme thinking well where am I going to get more tax when I'm wondering about you know the fuel bill so you know, this has got to be something that we look at in the whole, uh, but it's not going to go away in. Fergus Sharkey. Uh, fascinated. I start out most things in life with a very simple premise that society has an obligation to protect the vulnerable. I think what's sitting at the core of this question is actually a bigger philosophical issue about what is the world we want to build over the next 15, 20 years. The care thing is clearly a litmus test to everything else and any number of other problems and issues, you quickly lapse into the NHS, you quickly talk about all of those people that are on strike right now and the punitive wages that they have upon them and clearly they're incapable of having any kind of further tax burden placed upon them. The simple truth is we need to have a big philosophical conversation that does not involve privatising the NHS, that does not involve lumping those that are least capable in society of carrying that burden and if some of the rest of us, like myself, and I'm 65 this year so I qualify I'm over 50, if we have to pay 50, a bit more, so be it so long as we all end up living in a fairer, fairer, more caring, more transparent, more joined up world, because the policy we have right now and what we've done for the last 12 years has failed. It hasn't worked. I mean, this is, goes back a lot more than 12 years, though, doesn't it? Because sure. I, I remember back in the latter days of the Brown government, there was yeah. um, cross-party talks on how to solve this. And yet here we are, 12, 13 years on. Uh, and <laughs> no, well, Barry, why, why do you think it is that... This, I mean, should there be a Royal Commission on social care or something? Because at, at the moment, it, it, everyone seems to agree that it's not working, yeah. something must be done, well, look, but nobody can yet agree on what. You, you went back to the cross-party talks that took place. The Conservatives withdrew from those talks, as you know. Um, laterally, uh, the Conservative Prime Minister, but two, three... Um, <laughs> promised that they would... Cheap laugh there. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly couldn't remember. Um, but, you know, announced that there was a, a, a plan already to go. There wasn't. Um, there is still no plan. And we do need to make sure that whenever a plan is brought forward, it's not simply brought forward by one side to be rubbished by the other. We need to have a plan that is going to be able to garner cross-party support because then we know that the rest of the country will, will accept it and think, yeah, that will work. Um, and this is too important. And as you say, it's dragged on for too long now. Um, we do need to fix it. So... A royal commission is often a way of, of, you know, putting things into the long grass. I think this government has decided that it's going to see what happens at the next general election and if it's still there, then it'll have to do something about it. But if it's not still there, then thank God we haven't had to sort the problem So no, out. another 18 it, months of inertia. But, but, but more than that, Ian, it may be that if there is a new government after 18 months or two years, um, then in fact we go back to the old Yarbu Sucks system and it's, well, it's your problem now, you're not doing the right thing about it and we then don't get that 
that cross-party consensus that we need. That's why I think the government should bring forward plans, even though we are in perhaps the final stages of, of a government, they should bring those plans forward and we should actually get round the table and try and okay. sort it out. Um, Richard has some insight here on the text. He says the archbishop is a vicar, not a politician. Actually, he's an archbishop, not a vicar. I don't think the two are the same, are they? I'm not, I'm not very, he, he is, I'm not very he ecclesiastical. He is a vicar of Christ. I'll take your word for that. Because you stand <laughs> vicariously in the place of Christ. Well, we're, we're grateful for that insight because I don't think any of us could have provided that, Barry. Thank you very much. We well, learnt more than the birds in the garden this morning, <laughs> didn't we? Wow, impressive. As long as there were no bees. It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Every Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. We have with us Fergal Sharkey, Mims Davis, Barry Gardner and Stephanie Flanders. Let's go to a text question from Michael in Rains Park. Given that we have 5 million people capable of working right now who are on benefits, in a tight labour market, and most economists are predicting that unemployment will go up this year, as Stephanie might confirm, we'll find out in a moment, uh, do we still need unrestricted low-skilled immigration into this country? How is it sustainable to have this many people on welfare, even in the most tight of labour markets? Markets. Well, people who withdraw from the labour market aren't necessarily on benefits, are they? No, no. And as we know, it's sort of the, 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 the fact that there's so much low wage work now. We have now got to a point where the majority of people cat categorised, or certainly families categorised as poor in this house, in this country, have got at least one person doing a job, which was never the case. I mean, in the 80s, poverty was something that was the uh, was the elderly and the unemployed. And that is not, not true in either of those cases. Now it is, is it of, often people working. So that's that's 
that's not true. We we have seen, and this is also true in some other countries, we've seen a lot of people leave the labour force during COVID and we're not entirely sure why. It's partly um, older people retiring and not going back to the workforce. I have to say, not to hark back to Ben's question earlier, but actually there is some evidence that it's also people, we've got people with long-term sickness now. Mm. Um, the length of the NHS queues means that people are actually having to stay out of the workforce who, if they'd had that operation, whether it's a hip operation or anything else, would be back um, in the workforce. So, again, all these things are uh, are connected. But I, well, I'm not sure we do have unrestricted, unskilled no. immigration, which is partly why it's so hard to find people to work in restaurants. <laughs> but do you think we need to loosen the immigration rules at the moment when there do seem to be lots of labour shortages in all sorts of different sectors? You know, I think there are these sectors who are, that are crying out for support where they've and they have progressively had to have an increase in quotas and an increase in things. I think that probably makes sense. But I mean, anyone can see that it's for those particular skills problems, it's a short term issue. And I have always thought, I'm not sure that there's a I'm not sure I've got a perfect policy for this but I have always thought that employers that did that should have to also sponsor or be part of a scheme for training up yeah. young people or training or in mm. fact older people um, um, for the jobs that they're bringing people in for because you, we do need to have some some answer to these skills problems that you hear about again and again and of course are a decades old problem. Fergus Sharkey. I, I'm always kind of thrilled when people ask this question is invariably I gently remind them uh, you're talking to someone who lives in this country as an Irish passport holder thanks to an amendment to the Immigration Act in 2020. As I did find myself sitting at home in North London in the middle of Brexit suddenly thinking good Lord, am I actually going to be allowed to live in this country? And in fact, the British government had to go so far as amending the Immigration Act to ensure that Irish people could continue to productively live, Did they live, mention work, you in vote. the bill? Did they say uh, this is I, specifically... I, I, tried, I tried to get them to call it <laughs> Fergal's Bill, but they didn't have it. Fergal's um, Law. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes to kind of people withdrawing from the workforce, again, I have to put my hand up. I retired 10 years ago, so I'm not involved in the workforce, but I hope that I'm not at a demand on the state or anyone else. So for me, the whole basic premise of the question is kind of fairly false and ridiculous and reactionary in the first place. And I think the whole discussion about uh, unskilled workers coming to this country, well, there's actually no evidence of it than any scale that I'm aware of. And in my wife's side of the family, they're originally farmers from Lincolnshire, and I gather that there's any number of industries out there and sectors of the economy that have been crying out for people to help, and indeed government have opened up but the, temporary but visa But the, the argument was that there, there was unrestricted immigration from Europe up until we well, the European yeah, that, that, Union, uh, and, and there were sectors of the economy which specialised in bringing lots of unskilled people in and paying them a pittance in wages and actually doing British people out of a job, and that was... A, a um, big part of the reason why the Brexit vote happened. Uh, well, I'm not sure that's actually the case. And again, if anybody wants to leave me, wants me to leave the country as I was, one of those low-skilled uh, foreigners that came to this country in 1978, I'll happily leave if everybody feels that badly about it. I'm not sure that that's the case at all, as clearly part of the music industry, the nighttime economy, live music depends an awful lot upon those workers coming in. So I'm not sure that this problem was, A, as big as people paint it in the first place. I think it is is actually quite reactionary and I think the way we're looking at it going forward if we need to have those sectors of the economy that need the support then we're going to have to find a way to provide it to them otherwise we're just as my mum would have said you're biting your nose to spite your face. Barry Gordon The first thing I, I want to do is to say that f over 40% of the people in this country who are on benefits are also working and I think it's important to understand that. They would love, many of them would actually love to be doing more work, but can't. They can't for various reasons. Sometimes it's because they've got caring responsibilities. Sometimes it's because they're disabled themselves and can't work more than uh, 15 hours a week. Um, so many of the people who Arcola was talking about uh, actually would love to have more work, but can't. And as a result, they can't make ends meet. Um, if you're talking about people who have voluntarily left the workforce, then Stephanie, I think, has, has covered that. Many of them, I think we also should say that many people after COVID decided they wanted a change in their lifestyle. And if they could afford to retire at that point or to leave work at that point, a number of them have done so. And I think 
there is a job here that perhaps government needs to do because we desperately need those skills. Uh, many of them are, are actually highly skilled people. But Strange it's, it's, though it is, yeah. I'm chairing a seminar tomorrow morning with ah. Guy Opperman, the Employment Minister, on how to get the over 50s back, back into, into the workforce. Well, because I think <laughs> right. you're absolutely right. This is, this is, absolute, this is mm. really crucial. Yeah, it is. But I, I think what our caller was... And sorry, I've forgotten the caller's name. Uh, it uh, was Michael. Michael. I, I think, Michael, what you were referring to is low-skilled uh, jobs. And actually, we had the Minister for uh, Farming before us this afternoon in the Select Committee, and he was complaining that actually we can't get enough people to come in and pick our fruit and pick our vegetables, and we've had to actually make special dispensation now as a country to allow those low-skilled people to come in from Europe, the, the, the migrant labour that does come in and do that. But Stephanie's right, we don't actually pay them very well when they do. Um, so I, I think there's a number of factors here, but critically, we do need to train up our own people. And if there's one thing that, you know, I look to as a silver lining from Brexit, and as you know, Ian, I, I was a Remainer. I accepted the democratic view of the people and said, OK, that means we've got to leave. But one thing that I do absolutely acknowledge that Brexit has shown is that we did not invest enough in skills and training and apprenticeships. And that was the source of a real problem. But we're not doing it yet. We're not doing it enough yet. And companies need to take on that responsibility okay. and make sure that they're training young people. Ms Davis. Well, so much to say on this because I've spent the last three and a half years at DWP with the employment uh, brief and, and now focused on, on social mobility uh, and youth and those disadvantaged groups and the people left behind and, and wondering uh, what's next for them and looking at the different barriers that are holding them back. And I'm delighted, in to see that you're working with Guy in the morning on this really important uh, topic. And I, I think... I'm being paid. Oh, oh well, well... <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's good because you're absolutely... I'm over 50, why if, shouldn't I yeah, Well, absolutely, <laughs> a fair pay for, for fair work. Um, but obviously Stephanie's covered some of the reasons for the change. People have acquired health conditions. They may be caring for others, uh, both young and old. They may be taking the, the change of life route uh, that Barry's mentioned. Uh, but I think there's, there's lots in this. Uh, sectors need to get their act together as we get um, towards um, apprenticeship week about uh, attracting particularly young people in, uh, better and easier recruitment. Some of the jobs that we've heard about, actually it's not the job that's so difficult because actually many people want to work, for example, in the UK wine industry. It's a fantastic place to and growing area and well paid, but actually it's hard work. And, and some of the particular agricultural sectors, it's the accommodation and the life that goes with it. It's quite challenging and isolating and it's a competing labour market. So we need technology in some of these areas as well to help with some of those less attractive roles. And actually that can help in the care sector as well. Um, you know, video calls, checking that pills have been taken, uh, safety, etc. There are ways of uh, lightening that labour load. But actually I think it's about job design and valuing these roles as well. We all love hospitality. We missed it greatly during COVID. Yet so few people want to go into the sector. But whether Why is that? I don't understand. If I was 22 or something, I'd think I would love to do that. Well, if you think, you know, we go away on holiday and what do we often choose to go to one of the most well-known and revered hospitality or restaurants? Quite often family run and, and really brilliant place to be. And actually we talk about hospitality as seasonal and low skill. But actually within three to five years with a great apprenticeship and a great employer and people like Green King are brilliant at this. Uh, they You can be running an establishment and earning really decent money. So I think some of the people that we've been talking about today, whether it's doing more hours, making sure the benefit system pays you to progress, which is exactly what universal credit is about, and helping people to know how to be better off is absolutely key. And we, I be assured, Secretary of State and I and all at DWP are incredibly focused on this. And I cannot uh, commend my civil servants and the teams in job centres up and down the land, uh, doing job fairs and highlighting quite often these Cinderella sectors where people, you know, a bit snooty and have a view about whether 
you want to work in them or not. They are some of the most brilliant places for progression, which is really important, particularly for young people. Um, Tom says on a text, Ian, you're giving the panel an easy ride tonight. It's because they're giving such brilliant answers. So why am I going to have a go at them? <laughs> Lots of love for Fergal so far as well, mm -hmm. saying they're loving your passion, Fergal. So <laughs> you've got another half an hour of Fergal's passion to come. <laughs> Ooh, uh, misses. It's half past eight. <laughs> Charlotte, Morgan. <laughs> Charlotte Morgan has the LBC News headlines. The family of a law graduate who was murdered in East London are blaming probation officers for her death. A report found a catalogue of errors allowed Jordan McSweeney to kill Zara Alina just days after he was released on licence. The Foreign Office has confirmed the deaths of two British volunteers in Ukraine. Statements on behalf of Chris Parry's family say he and colleague Andrew Bagshaw were killed whilst trying to evacuate civilians. And papers marked as being classified have been found at the home of former US Vice President Mike Pence. His lawyers say they were inadvertently boxed and transported to the house in Indiana at the end of his term in office. LBC weather, light rain moving southeastwards towards Northern Ireland and Scotland overnight, staying dry for most of England and Wales with a low of minus five. This is LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.32 is the time on LBC. Fergal Sharkey is here, environmental campaigner, former frontman of the Undertones. Mims Davis, social mobility minister, Conservative MP for Mid-Sussex. Barry Gardner, Labour MP for Brent North, former Shadow International Trade Secretary. And Stephanie Flanders, economist and senior executive editor at Bloomberg. What does that mean, senior executive? Are they junior executive <laughs> You know, my editors? title keeps changing, Fergal, but I don't want to be precious about it. You know, they keep giving me more things to what do to you run. do? So I run, I've got a team of economists. I've got about 40 economists. And 40? Then I have, yes. And then How I also they come to have... a conclusion? And I have... It's, it's hopeless, but that's all right. They're, glo they're global, so they don't necessarily right, have to okay. talk to each other. Uh, and 100 economic reporters and 100 political reporters all around the world. It's a little so empire. We, it is an empire. Yeah. And I somehow find time to do my Stephanomics podcast as well, which is almost as and good as And find time to do this. Yes. Fantastic. Indeed. Right, let's go to another question. Um, Corey, my producer, says, can we do a few questions in this quarter, which does rely on shorter answers, I'm afraid. Um, Stephen in East Grinstead, uh, what would you like to ask? Hi. Good evening. Uh, apologies to the rest of the panel, but when I heard Mr Sharkey was going to be on the show, I thought I'd have to ask this question. Do the water companies and the government need a few teenage kicks up the you-know-what regarding water pollution and wastage? Well, I have to come to you first, Fergal. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I've, we've actually just been discussing it. I'm very, very happy for people to pun my previous life, uh, simply because I've developed this little fine system. So I will post details online in the morning in my Twitter feed exactly where you can pay your £20 fine <laughs> for that uh, rather appalling pun. Uh, Sorry, Stephen. In, in terms of the kind of whole sewage and environmental thing going on, uh, this country is now one of, if not the most nature depleted, biodiversity depleted in Europe. So in many ways, what's going on in our rivers is just symptomatic of a much broader, bigger conversation. And yes, does the whole thing need brought into rain? Well, let me try it this way around. Over the last two years, water companies have spent nearly £6 million, pounds, um, six million hours dumping sewage into our rivers. Uh, water companies since privatisation have now paid out £72 billion in dividends to their shareholders. We see little benefit from it. And in fact, 
I was discussing it this morning. As we speak, there is a sewage overflow in Chichester Harbour which has been dumping sewage into a site of special scientific interest, one of the most protected areas in the country, since the 23rd of December 2022. Non-stop. And it's not the only one. So... Does somebody need to get a hold of it? Yes. Has government succeeded in that task so far? Personally speaking, they're a long way from it. But we have the Environmental Environment Agency. That is their job, presumably, to regulate this. Uh, sort of I, as you Why can see, I'm smiling. It? Well, there's a very good question. Um, and the simple fact of the matter is, I have now encapsulated that the Environment Agency has simply become a hotbed of mediocrity and incompetence. And that's the reality of where it is. It has been utterly decimated. Um, and again, this is not a party political broadcast on my part. It is simply factual. The then Secretary of State in 2015 willingly and willfully set out to ultimately deregulate and decapitate the Environment Agency. And in fact, the Secretary of State at the time, the clips out there, stood in Parliament boasting about how she cut the uh, farming red tape by 80% and cut farming inspections that year by 34,000. Step forward, Secretary of State for the Environment, Liz Truss. There was clearly an indication there that going in hard, going in fast would have consequences. And we now are facing the consequences of those decisions, of those budget cuts, where every single river in England is now polluted. And one of the biggest sources of that pollution is agriculture. Did that deregulation have an impact? And the second largest source is water companies. You deal with those two, you've dealt with 70-80% of the problem. Are there figures that we can compare? Because, I mean, there's always been uh, sewage sort of let, let yep. into, into rivers, but how does this compare with, say, 15 or 20 years ago? Um, well, there isn't because it took the uh, European Commission taking the UK government to court in 2012 to the European Court of Justice, and it was the European Court of Justice ruled that the UK was acting illegally by allowing water companies to do this. To be fair, they've done that with many other EU countries uh, they as have. well. That, in turn, then triggered government in 2013, demanding that by 2020, water companies would start installing the monitors. So we've actually only had the equipment begin to roll out over the last two or three years. And already the scale of it, as we know, is just horrific. And I suspect we're seeing the tip of the iceberg. As I've said, give you another example, uh, down in Berkshire, there's a little sewage treatment plant that has been dumping sewage into uh, a tributary of the Kennet, a chalk stream, non-stop since the 19th of December 2022. And the Environment Agency does what? Well, I'm still probing for an answer after four or five years. A chalk stream of which we hold the most in the world. It's there, one of the rarest uh, biomes and there, we actually have the most of correct. them anywhere. Uh, so that is a, such a serious neglect it's unbelievable but i i think your caller's got his 20 quids worth you know and uh, as, as for shorter answers you know who can follow that uh, like you, i'm on the select committee and i couldn't have, i couldn't have regaled <laughs> it as, as well as Fergal. look I'd, I'd sign up for most of this it's inexplicable except that we know that regulation is really hard and regulators tend to get captured but even so it's hard to understand how this could have could continue to happen i would give a minuscule shout out but Fergal will explain to me why they're doing it to, to uh, Thames Water, who have now put online in live time where all of the um, latest in the last the sort of hot spots and in the last 24 hours when there has been um, an unregulated load of sewage going onto the river. I, I assume they've been forced to do this, but that kind of transparency if it's going to fire a bit more indignation is probably helpful and I would give them some credit for having put it out there. Mims, um, you represent a very beautiful part of the country. Presumably, you've got this problem in your constituency. Well, I think, think Stevens might be think one of Ste my constituents. Stink was probably... <laughs> Sorry, uh, I don't know why I was nearly right saying word. Stephen <laughs> is one of my constituents. So, good evening, Stephen. Um, look, uh, we... Going back, there was no monitoring... And, and you're right, Ian, there was no monitoring of what was going on. And this government has stepped forward. Uh, and Rebecca Powell is... forced to step forward. 
I don't think so. The biggest bill that we've done in this uh, government is, to, you know, two years of the Environment Bill, which is uh, absolutely um, and uh, about um, protecting biodiversity and, and updating the, the next stages. And I think Stephanie's right. This is about the sunlight of disinfection on this issue, which is why um, environmental uh, focus is exactly what um, Off What have got on the table, and that is... Uh, led through that bill um, we have of course improved um, bathing waters and we know this because we've got the monitoring there was no monitoring under the Labour government before us uh, so you know to be indignant now we all should be because this isn't good enough but there wasn't any monitoring and there is now and some of the chemicals that Fergal has uh, talked about there was no monitoring or uh, ability to know that they were there we know that now and we're able to tackle this so it's absolutely right but you say you're able to tackle it but you've got the environment agency that don't seem to be able to yeah, do it. You I... mentioned off what there. I mean, I don't know which of those holds the answer. But I mean, why, why aren't they able to tackle this? They are, and I and, but and not. that's the, this is the bit that concerns me because you not you haven't got just raw sewage going everywhere. No, you we have. have, we have. No, you that, haven't. No, 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 it's going in particular places yes. which you can monitor. That yeah. it's pure raw sewage is not true, uh, and that and well, it's that, pretty horrible stuff, whatever it is. And we're all responsible for making that, and of course, clean. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the water companies are responsible for dealing with it. Otherwise, why have them? Absolutely. So that's why another fifty-six. Um, I think it, I don't know whether it's billion or. Million, and I, put, I forgive the water. I'll have to ask the water minister exactly how much. But there's a next announcement on the next stage of this plan, and we have got a grip of this. Uh, and the water minister uh, under Labour or under the coalition didn't. And I'm very proud of the work we're doing. That have we done enough? No, uh, Fergal's right. Keep holding this to account. Listen, it's the right me, thing. Let me just clarify, check my notes. Me, Fifty-six million. Let me just go, clarify me. something here. On the morning of the 26th of August 2022, dumping sewage into the environment was illegal had it been adjudicated to be so by the European Court of Justice. That afternoon, government implemented its sewage reduction plan, which for the next 28 years has now legalised water companies to dump sewage into the environment so long as they can argue they were doing something, and I'm quoting the legislation, to reduce the adverse impacts. Whatever reduction is, whatever an impact uh, is, who knows? That. The simple truth is government have, willingly or otherwise, actually now legalised something that was illegal uh, by the judgment of the European Court. That is not And progress. there'll be 100% look... of monitoring uh, where previously there was none. OK, so you, you made that point. <laughs> that, Let, let's let's move on to a different subject. Um, <laughs> Listen to Corey, he wants to do us to do Well, I am trying to. I, <laughs> Good I, I, luck I, I at least that have to make an appearance <laughs> of doing so. Uh, Brian is in Wolverhampton and has got a text question. Since the Church of England is determined to continue with policies which discriminate against gay people, People, should it be disestablished now? Well, let's go over to our religious affairs correspondent, Barry Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> um, I disagree with the position that the, uh, the Archbishop has adopted uh, for himself. He has put it that uh, he, he would not um, uh, bless those relationships personally. And he said that that's because he is the head of the Anglican church rather than simply the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Church of England. Um, my own view is that if you believe that the decision to take that has been taken to bless those relationships and you believe that's right, then you should just get on and do what you say is right. It's called um, leadership, isn't it's it? It's called leadership. So do you think that the church should be disestablished, not just because of this? Um, I think the establishment of any church is a very difficult matter. We have a history that goes back to a particular divorce in the 16th century, um, which Several. led us to be separated from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and it's been entangled ever since. Sometimes that entanglement has been a good thing. I think mostly it's not. So I'm deducing from that that you're kind of tempted to for disestablishment, but you're not. Ian, particularly the honest bothered. thing is, I I don't think that the people of this country any longer think it's important. Okay, Mims. I I personally think that that the church needs and wants 
uh, its flocks and communities to be reflected in, in the work that it does in the community. And I think for me, I would like to, to see uh, that happening in, in church and that people who uh, are wanting that uh, blessing and that love to be recognised can have that within their community church. I understand people take different views, but, you know, the world is changing and, and I do feel that, that the church wants more people to be part of it and does a great job in many areas and I'd love to it to, for be as inclusive and welcoming as possible yeah. uh, for, for me that's the most important thing can, very quickly can I just uh, agree with Mims on that and you know I 30 or 40 years ago I was fighting for the ordination of women um, I was fighting for the church to accept gay relationships and I just think there has been a huge transformation within the church to to recognize and and now to have women bishops and and to so there has been progress but always it seems to be that the church is lagging behind on these social and sexual matters okay, and that's a great on. shame uh, one of the things that makes me remarkably proud of to be irish is the journey my country's mm. been through in the last 30 years yeah. it, it's a loose generalization 30 years ago, 85% of the population of Ireland went to Mass on a Sunday. Priests would get up in pulpits and tell 85% of the population what to do, and we would all do it. In the intervening three decades, Ireland became the first country in the world to elect a woman as president in a national referendum, the first country in the world to pass equality of marriage legislation at a national referendum, has amended the Constitution not once but twice to legalise abortion and contraception, and as we speak, has been governed very successfully, I think, by the openly gay son of an Indian immigrant and a atheist poet we've re-elected as president for a second term there's a lesson there for everyone mm. stephanie <laughs> i i mean i i agree that the, the bigger the gap between the church and where society is um the more they might be at risk of this kind of argument about uh taking them out of the mm. center of our nation but i i think that they have you know what we would call their their anchor institutions in a community and where you know universities increasingly play that role and i would like them to be able to continue to play that role and i just think we have so many other things to worry about yeah. that getting into an, a battle over the official role of mm. the church is not sort of just shouldn't be very would cause an almost awful sort of grief for lots of people in the country to not very good end mm -hmm. but i would like them to be accepting that communal role that mims has talked about um, but, which many of them do i mean yeah. they do play that role in many in many parts of the world. and i suspect will also play that role with gay communities in many parts of the country right thank you all very much for brief answers it's 847 lbc Hello.
leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. Stephen in South End says, is the guest on your show the same Fergal Sharkey who sang A Good Heart is Hard to Find in the 1980s? <laughs> it, it, I can exclusively reveal it is the one and same. And uh, Stephen, you can pay a £20 fine too. Uh, look on Fergal's Twitter feed tomorrow. And um, Tony in Woodford says, can you ask Fergal that an easy way into employment for him would be to reform the original lineup of The Undertones? He'll be very busy for years and probably make millions. Um, well, you see, as I mentioned earlier on, I am one of that 50-plus uh, that's retired from the workforce, apparently, or not available. Um, clearly, that may intonate that I don't have a huge anxiety about my gas bill next month. Um, so the money doesn't matter do, do, to me. Do you not miss the sort of live performances? Um, oh, li li listen, it would be uh, foolish of me to suggest that if you really want to experience something extraordinary walk out on a stage in front of 100,000 yeah. people who start applauding and all you've actually done is walk across the stage. You haven't even <laughs> oh, played wow. a note yet. That's not politics. And if you have kind of <laughs> anything... Yeah, they start booing before you say anything. <laughs> exactly. Anything resembling an ego, you just go, oh my Lord, this is fantastic. But let's face it, right now I'm having way too much fun picking a fight and making fun of DEFRA and government and the water companies well, and Thames Water and Southern Water. you're doing a very water, good job of it. And all of them. Our, our listeners here. Right, um, a very different question now from Pete in Tewkesbury, says if Ukraine receives enough military hardware to make Putin properly nervous, what is the likelihood that he will use a tactical nuclear weapon? And, and just on that, the atomic scientists in America behind the doomsday clock moved it forward another 10 seconds to 90 seconds to midnight today, the closest it's ever been, which seems a little bit of an overreaction if you think about the Cuban Missile Crisis and one or two other things. Um, Mims, let's start with you. Oh dear... <laughs> Oh, come on. I feel like I want to go back to the water question. That's saying something. I did ask for a short answer. I know. So. I mean, I'm, you know, this is having a terrible... I mean, I, I've spent um, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Saturdays ago, with uh, my Ukrainians in my constituency celebrating their Christmas and, and hearing from families who are who are going through such hell, worrying about their, their friends and family. And, you know, this would be too hard for anyone to, to bear. Uh, I just feel that we have to continue to stand up to Putin, all of us through the through NATO, the G7, the EU, the partnerships that we have to make sure that this is a completely unthinkable scenario. And that's all I think I can. I do think not about. think that if if I mean Germany has now today said it will send tanks to Ukraine. If every other European country does as well, and Zelensky gets his three hundred tanks, um, I mean that that may be seen by Putin as a huge provocation, that it, it will be NATO countries that are doing this, and you can't rule out him doing something like using a tactical nuclear weapon. And he has uh, set forward a huge provocation himself. And therefore, there is a reaction. And obviously, people are looking to what Germany have done. But, you know, we are, you know, having to stare right back. It's extremely challenging. Um, but the reality of the situation, I don't think we've got any choice other than okay. the backing our Ukrainian partners and, and doing what's right and continuing to, to make that point, working with, with our American partners and, as I say, NATO, G7, uh, G, uh, EU, the G7. But, yeah, who knows? But I certainly think a backing down is not the right okay, answer. Stephanie. If you talk to the military strategists, I think there is quite a big feeling now that there's a moment of weakness, that Putin is having trouble getting the supply lines back and forth mm. to his troops. Um, he's not got a capacity to sort of ma even maintain the ground he's on, let alone push forward. So there was a, there's a quite a strong feeling yeah. that Ukraine has a fairly short window to get at least some of it, some of the land back, which could then provide the basis for beginning a negotiation. That's what everybody wants. So they want negotiation, but it has to be up to the Ukrainians to say, OK, we're in a position now mm. where we can... And at the moment, they have quite an extremist position on that. I am told by people who are much better informed on this than me, some, many of which work at Bloomberg, uh, that the, he has certainly not done any of the things that he would have had to have done to be in a position to do that anytime soon. There are things that they monitor, the spooks, which they, there's also practical things like he doesn't have any equipment 
for his troops to go into an area where there has been a nuclear weapon. So that immediately rules out doing it in some part of Ukraine that he would then want to take overtake, which makes certainly reassures me a little bit. You could still have rather scary scenarios about letting things off the nor- over the North Sea or the Baltic or mm. whatever. But the general feeling is he's a lot further from that than we might have feared a few months ago. And he's been pushed quite far without seeming to respond. But he is not a rational man. Yeah. Well, I feel reassured by that, Fergie. <laughs> um, well, clearly I'm an expert in this because I read Twitter. <laughs> Um, I think uh, Stephanie's just given you the perfect analysis. I think the whole question of some sort of a nuclear event is just scaremongering. And the reality is it's now moving into the end game. And if we're lucky, we can come up with a no score draw. And I think you're completely right, Mim. We have to support the Ukraine as it is intolerable that it ever happened in the first place. And we have to put a stop to it as quickly as possible. We should also say that an ongoing stalemate, a kind of perma war, is a really frightening scenario yeah. if you're Ukrainian. They're the ones who will suffer yeah. most from that. So we have to, we should be appropriately scared of that as well. Barry. Yeah. The danger with ratcheting up is that it just keeps on going. And I I agree with Stephanie's analysis, and I'm very glad that she focused it around the need for negotiation. Because we all know that ultimately, you don't win these things simply by, you know, keeping on going with the military option. Russia is a very big country. You certainly don't win them by not doing them. uh, Absolutely. Hmm. And and that's where, where everyone on this panel is absolutely united. Um, that we have to ensure that Ukraine has the wherewithal to be able to to defend itself properly um, and to repel the invasion that's taken place. Um, But I do think that we need to have clarity about the basis of the negotiation. And you said, Stephanie, that it was for Ukraine to decide when that should happen. I don't think it is only for Ukraine to decide when that happens. I believe that given the level of support from the rest of the world and the implications for the global community, uh, the UN and all of us have a responsibility to be trying to create the conditions in which it can. Part of that is to push back Russia and show that we're not going to give way. Um, But part of it is also trying to open some back doors and make sure that those discussions can take place with the people that we're going to need to. Right, a a tweet question from Chris, and you could answer with a yes or no if you want to, given that we haven't got much time left. Uh, Should Jeremy Corbyn be readmitted to the Parliamentary Labour Party, Barry Gardner? Yes, he's he's done the three things that were asked of him when he was evicted from the Parliamentary Labour Party. Um, he's made the apologies. He's done all the things that Has were he? asked. Of. Yes, in, in, not all at, not that. all at once, not all at once. Um, but uh, he's done them in different at different times. Okay, uh, and so I I think he should um, be readmitted. Yes, Mims. Um, well, I would do us a favour if, uh, if uh, <laughs> we let him in to go for it, Barry. <laughs> Stephanie? I can't summon up a view on that, to be honest. I think it is up to the Labour Party to decide, but they will have to look at some of the things that he said in the past and think about it. Fergal? Um, I do think about these things, and I think the answer is no, because I'm not sure that some people have had the apology they were hoping for with the clarity and succinct explanation that they were expecting. Indeed. Okay, right. A final uh, fun text question. Janet in Wrexham says, David Walliams has now been axed from Britain's Got Talent and replaced by Bruno Tonioli from Strictly. But if you're appearing before Bruno and his fellow judges, what would your special talent be? Think very carefully and keep it tasteful. Fergal. <laughs> uh, did I tell you I can uh, drink a glass of water while actually singing a good heart? Do you want to try it? No, absolutely not. Oh, there you go. Sport, of sport, Stephanie. I'm quite good at lifting one eyebrow, and failing that, I could pack, <laughs> I could pack the back of a car really surprisingly well. It's one of my proudest skills. Mims. Oh, I thought. I have that as well. I think it's a mother thing. Um, I think I'd just be the bag lady because I don't appear to go anywhere without about 15 bags. So I think I'd try and have I say, all I think of them. You dress rather well. Oh, thank you. No, but no, anybody who knows me, I've got shoes, I've got bags, I've got files, I've got more things I ever need. So I think I could be like the person that puts loads of coats okay. on. I would do it with bags. Harry? 
<laughs> At university, my hobbies were known as whistling and shouting. <laughs> whistling and shouting. Well, I'll tell you what, you've given much better answers to our final question than our panel did last night, so well done for <laughs> that. Uh, thank you very much to Fergal Sharkey, Mims Davis, Barry Gardner and Stephanie Flanders. Remember, you can catch up on Cross Question if you miss an episode on the Cross Question podcast. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk about the menopause because ministers have projected a proposal from MPs to introduce menopause leave pilots in England, saying it could be counterproductive. They say it could discriminate against men. Now, um, I want to know what you think of that decision, but also, um, if you are going through the menopause, or you have done, how does it affect your ability to work? 0345 6060 973. And I realise that a man chairing this discussion might be seen as a little bit I'm bizarre, but I will... I will <laughs> you're fun. No, I won't say. Uh, but I'm, I'm willing to learn, basically. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 9 o'clock, Berlin is expected to give Poland permission to send tanks to Kiev. The German-made Leopard 2s are widely seen as the best choice to give Ukraine the edge against Russia. Andrei Zagodniuk is a former defence minister of Ukraine and current advisor. He's been telling LBC they'll be vital. Recently, 